Channel 18. I'm Charlie Walters. My guest today is David Adams Cleveland, who is both a novelist and an art historian. His most recent novel, which came out in May of 2022, is called Gods of Deception, and it's about the Alger Hiss case from the 1940s and 1950s. We're going to hear all about that, and we're also going to talk about his previous work in fiction and in nonfiction. David, thank you for doing this. Charlie, it's great to be with you. Why don't we start with you telling us who Alger Hiss was? Alger Hiss was a high State Department official who was convicted in 1950 in what is known as the greatest spy trial in American history of passing State Department top secret documents to his Soviet handler Whitaker Chambers in the late 1930s. Uh, so that uh, is, is, the, is the instant background on, on Alger Hiss, but Alger Hiss was a cause of huge controversy in this country. His conviction uh, for perjury, for passing those top secret Soviet uh, documents divided the country for 50 years. And even today, there are many people uh, who have a, a strong feeling one way or the other about whether Alger Hiss was in fact guilty or was he innocent. And uh, it divided the country pretty much along kind of Democratic, Republican, liberal, uh, conservative lines, strangely enough, um, even though uh, the, the conviction for spying uh, was something that I think all Americans uh, needed to know about and care about. I won't ask you to tell whether or not you think he was guilty or innocent. I'll let them uh, go to the book for that. But uh, what, when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s, Alfred Hiss was a name I knew. And I obviously knew that because my parents and their friends would be talking about him. It was still in the news you know, years later. But um, today, I, I'm wondering if the younger generations uh, know who Alfred Hiss was. Do you have any feel for that? Any sense of that? Well, in point of fact, I wrote the book and designed the plot uh, and the narrative precisely to deal with that issue. The plot revolves around uh, the judge, as he's known, who was a defender of Alger Hiss in 1950, who is 95 years old. This is just after 9-11, the year after 9-11. And he's writing his memoirs about the trial and trying to come to terms with it reality, the truth uh, to the Alger Hiss case. And he enlists his grandson, who is a Princeton astrophysicist, also a gallerist, uh, to help him uh, in preparing these uh, memoirs for publication. So the book actually revolves around his grandson's attempt to come to terms with the truth about Alger Hiss. And he does that by uh, interviewing and talking to his grandfather and investigating um, the uh, background of the Alger Hiss case. And uh, not to give much away, the book is very clear that Alger Hiss was in fact guilty. He was guilty uh, way beyond anything that came out in the trial, which was the uh, passing of uh, top secret the State Department papers to his accuser, Whitaker Chambers, in the late 1930s. Um, his, his crimes were that of an agent of influence. We now know uh, from the, what happened in the 1990s with access to uh, Soviet military intelligence and KGB files and the publication of uh, decrypted Soviet cables traffic uh, the Venona decrypts as they are known, which gave us a much broader, deeper understanding of the depths of Soviet penetration of this country in the 30s and 40s and early 50s. We now know that Alger Hiss was an agent of influence who sat at Roosevelt's right hand at the Yalta conference and was debriefed every morning by his Soviet uh, handler, gave away all the negotiating positions of the American delegation and the allies. And we also know that on the way home from Yalta, Alger Hiss stopped in Moscow for the very one single day of his entire life 
that he spent in the Soviet Union. And there in Moscow, in a secret ceremony, he was taken aside and given the Order of the Red Star by the head of Soviet intelligence. So yes, Alger Hiss was guilty, guilty far beyond his accuser, Whitaker Chambers probably was even aware of the Whitaker Chambers probably sensed that there had been a lot more going on uh, than even he uh, knew about. So Alger Hiss represents the tip of the iceberg. We now know that there were 500 Soviet agents in the US government uh, and related war industries in the 30s, 40s and early 50s. This on top of a membership uh, in the American Communist Party of over 200,000 uh, people, Americans, who were drawn to uh, the Soviet Union and the Communist Manifesto. And that 200,000 provided the proving grounds, the background uh, uh, for a lot of these uh, Soviet spies. Uh, that, uh, that um, came out of the Communist Party and moved into the government and related war industries. So the, uh, the, the crimes and the harm that these spies did uh, to American interests is absolutely overwhelming. And all of that is told in the pages of Gods of Deception. Now, his lived for decades after he got out of jail and Till the day he died, he denied being a communist, which is an odd contrast to Whitaker Chambers, his enemy, if you will, who freely admitted being a communist. Um, what is his, his case for being innocent? Well, his case is a very poor one. Of course, the trial itself, uh, looking back on it today, it is hard to believe that anybody could have had any doubts about Hiss's guilt. But the ideological lines were drawn so starkly and so dramatically that um, half the country saw Hiss as a paragon of the Eastern establishment, of the New Deal, of all that was great about the New Deal and the Roosevelt administration, and the idea that their man could have been guilty of spying was such, I think, a terrifying idea because the ramifications of that were so, uh, so deep and so broad that they just couldn't believe it. During the trial, the critical witness against this was his spy handler, Whitaker Chambers who gave intimate details of his relationship with Alger Hiss and Priscilla Hiss. He talked not just about uh, how he had uh, picked up State Department papers every evening from the Hisses, uh, taken them away to a secret location where they were photographed, brought back early the next morning so, so that Hiss could return them to the State Department uh, safe. Um, but he lived with the Hisses. He took vacations with the Hisses. They parented together. They were bird watching buddies together. And Whitaker Chambers was able to give the most intimate details of the Hisses' life, where they had lived, what they thought, and their movements and the times that they were together. Uh, it was a rendition that he would ultimately write about in his great memoir, Witness. Uh, in great detail. So here you have a trial where Hiss's defense really only had one object, and that was to destroy the character of Whitaker Chambers, because Whitaker Chambers' uh, portrayal of the, uh, the way that he'd known the Hisses was so broad and deep that only by portraying him as really a, a crazy man uh, or, or somebody out with a with an ax to grind, uh, could they possibly uh, uh, account for Whitaker Chambers' details? And so that was really what the uh, his defense was about. It was about destroying uh, Whitaker Chambers. And failing that, the evidence against uh, his was overwhelming. They had the his Woodstock um, typewriter upon which many of the State Department papers had been typed. Many of the papers had uh, his, his handwriting on them. 
They knew from hisses made that who had seen uh, Whitaker Chambers uh, in the uh, in the hisses household and uh, other witnesses as well. So it really came down to, in a sense, uh, Whitaker Chambers uh, versus uh, Alger Hiss. But when all was said and done, looking back, even uh, the great uh, 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 portrayal of the Hiss trial, which was Alan Weinstein, who wrote the great book Perjury, uh, in detail about the trial 20 years after, ultimately came out uh, that Alger Hiss was in fact guilty, even as uh, Alan Weinstein had gone into writing the book, uh, being pretty sure he was gonna prove his innocent. So all things considered, uh, there is no question now that Alger Hiss was in fact guilty. What do you think drew Alger Hiss to communism? This is a great mystery in some ways because we now know um, of you, we've got the records that there were 200,000 American communists in the American Communist Party. So Hiss was not alone being drawn, if you will, to Marxist Leninism. Uh, he and many other Americans during the Depression, uh, which uh, uh, drew uh, many Americans to the economic policies of Stalin, to the five-year plans, to this kind of things, to a command and control uh, economy. Uh, America, many Americans were drawn to that. And we don't know in detail uh, Alger Hiss exactly when he joined the Communist Party, um, although we know pretty much when he became a, a Soviet agent. Um, but one has to believe that it was the, uh, the Great Depression, uh, which uh, was a factor in many Americans believing that there had to be a, a different way of approaching the economic political uh, life. But Alger Hiss is remarkable in, in many, many ways. The fact that he never uh, gave up or gave in. Uh, he would always proclaimed his innocence. He went after, he went through an appeals process that went nowhere. He went on the speaking trail proclaiming his innocence. He maintained his equanimity to his friends, to uh, his family, even though his wife, Priscilla Hiss, we have to think was consumed by anxiety uh, about, uh, about uh, portraying uh, their, their innocence. Alger Hiss soldiered on right to the end of his days. Alger Hiss is in some ways the most extraordinary spy of that period in that the great British spies, um, the Cambridge Five, Guy Burgess, Kim Philby, Donald McLean, John Cairncross, all of them were consumed by guilt, uh, being traitors to their country, traitors to their class. They were drunkards, all of them. They drank uh, heavily and finally uh, escaped uh, behind the Iron Curtain and uh, ended their days in their uh, Moscow dhakas, uh, dying of alcoholism, uh, and obviously men torn up by the fact that they had betrayed their country and their class. Alger Hiss, very different. He maintained his innocence uh, right along into his dying day, maintained his equanimity in face of really overwhelming evidence of his guilt. This is getting a little far afield, but what, um, why did the Cambridge, so many people from the Cambridge Five end up in Russia for the Soviet Union, but Alger Hiss did not? What were his motivations not to go over there? Well, Alger Hiss believed uh, he was a smart, canny lawyer. He very well spoken. Uh, besides being a top uh, State Department official, he'd become president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He believed he could brazen it out, uh, brazen it out against really almost overwhelming odds. You would have to think under any different situation, uh, a man, uh, with his Soviet handler testifying against him 
um, you would think that would be enough for him to, to flee the country. But uh, Alger Hiss was a cool customer. He thought he could brazen it out against all the odds. Uh, and for many Americans, he did to this day. Uh, there are many Americans who still uh, believe in his innocence. Uh, what made Whitaker Chambers turn away from communism? Well, we know very concretely uh, what the case with Whitaker Chambers. He wrote his masterful memoir, uh, Witness, which uh, is very strange. Uh, in its day, Witness was considered kind of a conservative book, strangely enough. Um, it was uh, embraced by the Republicans. It was embraced by uh, William Buckley. Uh, and this was a book written by an ex-communist who had seen the light and, uh, and uh, refuted his belief in Marxist-Leninism and become a Quaker, uh, a Christian, uh, and a man unalterably opposed to everything that Stalin and the communist movement stood for. So in the early 1950s, that was kind of bedrock, anti-Soviet, anti-communist uh, on the right wing. And yet if one reads Whitaker Chambers' book, Witness Today, uh, it's hard to believe that it was ever uh, considered a right-wing uh, screed or a right-wing memoir, since um, it, 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 uh, it tells the truth about what happened um, and how he moved from being a man of the left to a man of the middle. Uh, he spent 10 years as a Time Magazine um, editor, and he was really the foremost uh, editorial uh, voice in the war years and early 50s on Time magazine that understood Stalin's modus operandi and was able to dissect it um, with great deliberation and brilliance. We now know that uh, from that memoir that uh, Whitaker Chambers' break with Stalin occurred in 1938. Uh, when he realized uh, the purges going on in the Soviet Union that were decimating those closest to Stalin, the most fervent communists, he realized that the night of the long knives was out and that he was probably on the chopping block. So he tried to break Alger Hiss at that time, not only Alger Hiss, but Harry Dexter White, who was at Treasury Department, uh, another uh, major uh, Soviet spy of influence in the Roosevelt administration. He thought he had broken both of them. Um, but when he told Alger Hiss that he'd broken um, with the uh, military intelligence uh, and uh, Al Alger Hiss let it uh, be known in no uncertain times saying to Whitaker Chambers, yes, Stalin plays for keeps. And Whitaker Chambers knew at that point that uh, Alger Hiss would in fact turn on Whitaker Chambers, his friend for many years, and uh, would turn him into the KGB and uh, his life was in danger. So in fact, he fled um, to Florida with his family and hid out for many months and then changed his address uh, and ultimately became a uh, editor of Time Magazine. He did in 1939 with the Soviet Nazi pact um, go to the, uh, out of Burl, who was the security officer in the State Department and a close confidant of Roosevelt. And he gave the name of Alger Hiss and Donald Hiss, his brother, also a Soviet spy, Harry Dexter White and a bunch of others uh, in the Roosevelt administration, including Laughlin Curry, who was at that time in the White House working for Roosevelt also a Soviet spy. He gave Adolf, Adolf Burl those names uh, and Adolf Burl went to Roosevelt and he was dismissed with an expletive and uh, the list was put away uh, in the files and not seen for many years. Um, so we know that the, uh, the Soviet Nazi pack in particular uh, turned uh, 
uh, Whitaker chambers unalterably against uh, Stalin and the KGB and Soviet military intelligence. Well, you chose an, an endlessly fascinating topic, and I'm, I'm reading Gods of Deception now, and you, you write very elegantly, very descriptively. Um, how long did it take you to write this book? This book uh, took me uh, at least four years. There was a lot of research uh, going into it, and I went into the research thinking that, uh, like a lot of people, that Alger Hiss was, well, maybe he was guilty uh, passing those uh, fairly innocuous uh, State Department papers back in the 30s and was absolutely stunned to find the accumulated evidence from the 1990s um, that uh, made the guilt of, of his unequivocal. And, uh, but there were other elements uh, of the saga around the trial that were also very troubling. Things that were noted at the time that in the course of history have tended to be forgotten by many people. The fact of the matter is that a lot of potential witnesses against Alger Hiss disappeared or were killed, died, murdered. There was Lawrence Duggan, who was a, uh, uh, who was a colleague of Alger Hiss at the State Department, who fell from 16 stories on 45th Street in New York to his death. Uh, it was touted up as possibly suicide, but by all the evidence, it has the hallmarks of a KGB hit who had a specialty uh, about throwing people out of windows at great height um, uh, as a ways of uh, ambiguously murdering uh, their foes. William Remington, another spy, was murdered in Lewisburg prison when Alger Hiss was an inmate there two weeks before he left, William Remington was murdered, bludgeoned to death by a couple of the inmates, uh, probably a warning from the KGB to Alger Hiss that he better hold his tongue if he ever, uh, when he got out of Lewisburg, where he spent four years, if he had any intents of, uh, of, of telling the truth. Um, Lawrence uh, Lachlan Curry in the White House, very important spy, disappeared south of the border to Columbia. Uh, he was out of reach uh, for testimony uh, in the Alger Hiss file. Uh, Marvin Smith in the State Department, uh, sorry, in the Justice Department, who signed a very important document of a uh, transfer of an auto uh, that Hiss had transferred to the Communist Party. Uh, very important factor in the trial. Marvin Smith died of a six-story fall uh, in the interior staircase of the Justice Department. Again, another person unable to testify uh, in his trial. Alan Weinstein, sorry, Noel Field, another colleague in the State Department of uh, Alger Hiss, disappeared behind the Iron Curtain and was unable to uh, testify and was then hounded by, uh, by uh, uh, intelligent agents behind the Soviet, um, behind the Iron Curtain, uh, who uh, in time would admit that in fact, he knew all along that Alger Hiss was a spy. So there was a series of, uh, of deaths uh, of potential witnesses for Alger Hiss, all of which look in retrospect to be the work of the KGB. At the top, I mentioned that you're not just a novelist, you're also an art historian, and your knowledge of art history worked its way into Gods of Deception. Can you talk about that? Well, I've been an art historian uh, really for, for many years. My, uh, my book, uh, History of American Tonalism, 1880 to 1920, is the definitive book on the School of American Landscape Painting. Uh, that was overlooked uh, by many. Uh, uh, this came after the Hudson River School, and uh, it is a, uh, a chapter in our art history that is instrumental in who we are as people. It was uh, inspired by the Transcendentalists, by Emerson and by Thoreau, and uh, is a wonderful uh, American homegrown, real thing uh, landscape school. 
Uh, so that has inspired me uh, in terms of my fiction writing, which is my, my first love. Um, I often say that in my art history, I try to write narratives about the great uh, Tantalus artists and about their lives. And uh, in, my, uh, in my fiction, I try to uh, write a, a narrative background to set my characters in time and space where you feel the, the very atmosphere uh, of the time and place in which they're about. I find that's very important. I find it uh, very difficult reading fiction uh, where there's no background, where there's no setting, where you have no sense of time and place. So time and place is very important to me. And in Gods of Deception, this is especially important. Um, the art history comes into play on many levels. Um, the uh, old judge, uh, who is a main character uh, in the in Gods of Deception, lives in a wonderful old house in the Caskills. And uh, it's a McKim Meaden White home. And it has a 15th century Italian Renaissance painted ship's keel ceiling uh, that was imported uh, from the Veneto uh, at the turn of the century when the house was built. And this uh, ceiling shows the, the cosmos and the gods and goddesses uh, and the signs of the zodiac. And it's a wonderful ceiling. And this uh, presents a compact picture of the universe, which the character uh, characters in Gods of Deception come under the spell of um, as, the, uh, as the novel unfolds. And it's a interior beautiful universe um, of, a, of a place, uh, if you will, a home that needs to be saved, that the, uh, the Algerhis trial and the ramifications on three uh, generations of an American family have, in a sense, put this wonderful house, this home, under threat. Uh, so there's many dimensions, many levels uh, that Gods of Deception works at. And the art uh, plays a very instrumental part of it because. Uh, my, my sleuth, my, uh, astro, my Princeton astrophysicist, who comes in to help the judge uh, discover the truth about Alger Hiss, discovers an old cork board upstairs in the judge's office turned to the wall. It's been abandoned for at least five years because the judge is too decrepit to climb the stairs. And he looks at the cork board and he finds sketches of not only Alger and Priscilla Hiss, but a number of these characters that would have testified at the, uh, at the Hiss trial who died under mysterious circumstances. And these sketches are by uh, George's uh, grandfather on his mother's side, who was a great major artist uh, just after the turn of the century and uh, an artist uh, at the Woodstock uh, artist colony. And so this sets, uh, partly sets George on his journey. And we find out that in fact, not only his, uh, his grandfather, the judge is involved uh, with the, his case, but his grandfather, uh, George Altman, who was a sketch artist, a trial artist uh, at the his trial is also up to his neck uh, in the uh, his trial. His other grandfather, who also had a mysterious death falling from the Fishkill Bridge in Woodstock. So the book has many, many chapters, and many uh, turns of the plot, um, all of which I, I hope are fascinating and stimulating for the reader. Going back to art history for a moment, uh, tell us who uh, the major American tonalists are. Who are the most familiar names to the general public? The most familiar names are uh, George Innes and, and, uh, and uh, Albert McNeil Whistler. Uh, they would be the best known, but uh, there's also Tryon, there's Charles Warren Eaton, uh, there's Blake Locke, there's, there's at least 40 to uh, 50 of them. And these are, if you will, our nat national treasure, our undiscovered country. They are the most distinctive indigenous uh, art movement 
um, uh, in, the, in this country and they have inspired generations of artists to come. Uh, and if I don't say so myself, this book, My History of American Tonalism, has opened up uh, a new vista in American art. And uh, it's even inspired a new uh, a group of American painters. They call themselves the American Tonalist Society after the book. Uh, and they suddenly discovered their bloodline in the pages of this book, that in fact, uh, their moody atmospheric um, symbolic rendering of the landscape is not something uh, magical and new that just came out at the moment, but it has deep roots in the most distinctive cultural aspects of our country, going back to Thoreau and Emerson. So I'm delighted to have been uh, have pioneered the rediscovery of these great artists, brought them back to life. And in turn, these artists, these great American artists are inspiring new artists um, to, uh, take up, um, to, to take up the banner of tonalism and paint contemporary tonalism. It's all very exciting things. If I'm not mistaken, you won an award for that book. Is that right? Oh, it won a bunch of awards, the American Library Association Awards, silver medals, gold medals. It, yes, it did, it did very well. Um, thank you. And it's in a third edition um, uh, from, uh, uh, from um, I just forget the publisher. Oh, Abbeville, from Abbeville Press. And uh, that, uh, that third edition is practically sold out and we have a fourth edition on the way. So the book uh, is doing, doing very well. I'm very pleased. Let's talk a bit about some of your other novels. Tell us about Time's Betrayal. Time's Betrayal is, uh, is, a, is different, not so different. It's a, a generational family saga. It moves from the uh, period of the Civil War from Antietam to the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, so it doesn't quite cover some of the territory that Gods of uh, Deception covers, um, but this is very much about um, the American way, the American spirit. It's about a son's search for a lost father who was a CIA agent who uh, uh, walked through Checkpoint Charlie into East Berlin and was never seen again. And the questions uh, really revolve around whether the father was a spy, was he, uh, was he uh, fleeing the West, um, was he taken by the KGB? And so we follow uh, the story from the son's school days uh, in a prep school outside of, uh, of Boston, and finally on the trail of his father that takes him uh, to Greece, uh, to Venice, to England, and uh, back to this country, right uh, in the, fe in the uh, fatal year of 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall, where we learn about the, uh, the truth about his father. This is really uh, a modern day updating of the Telemachus in search of Odysseus. Uh, it's a big book, a long story, but it did win Best Historical Novel of uh, 2017. So I'm very pleased uh, that people seem to uh, be enjoying. And you wrote another novel called Love's Attraction. I did indeed, uh, a shorter book. Um, it's uh, when I was sitting at uh, Mitchell's on Sunday uh, with a stack of uh, Gods of Deception uh, a lot of readers came up to me and said, oh dear, this book is so long. I don't know if I can handle it, if I can carry it off island. And I kind of joked with them and say, well, my readers all tell me that they don't want my books to end so that they're happy with long books. So uh, I like to say that I'm the writer of the never ending story. This is to say that uh, Love's Attraction is a bit of a shorter book not quite as long as the others. But it, again, is a search, uh, in this case, for a lost love. It takes place mostly in Concord, Massachusetts, and I like to think of it as my Thoreau book, since Thoreau is a kind of behind-the-scenes character, and he inspires the main character 
in search of, uh, of his lost love. Uh, he comes back, uh, he, uh, he comes back to Concord where he went to school and uh, he finds out uh, that the woman who he thought had thrown him over was in fact a twin and he had a twin sister. And uh, he wonders in fact, if this is a, uh, uh, an issue of mistaken identity. Uh, and so he is off to solve the, the mystery between, behind these two twins, one of whom died tragically and the other who may still be alive in Venice. And uh, the second half of the novel is set in Venice. Um, as many of my books are indeed set in Venice, a city I love dearly and, and I find a way somehow to bring uh, uh, Venice into play. And uh, uh, Venice plays a big part in uh, Love's Attraction. So uh, I'm delighted by that. Uh, before we stop, I want to get back into Gods of Deception for a moment. One of the, I guess you'd say, facts about Alger Hiss, and I think maybe this also applies to the Cambridge Five, although I don't know nearly as much about them. In Alger Hiss, you have someone who was living, enjoying the fruits of, of capitalism, and yet he ended up subscribing to a belief that was, was anti-capitalism. Uh, he's not unique by any means. This is something we, we see a lot, and I'm sure you know much more about it than I'll ever know, but uh, can you talk about that? I mean, Alger, you would think that Alger Hiss would be one of the last people to be attracted to communism. Well, you would, and that the Eastern establishment, uh, John Foster Dulles was a supporter. Uh, he, had, he had major supporters uh, throughout the government, throughout the Roosevelt administration. Uh, he seemed to be, he was also uh, partly uh, a force behind the creation of the United Nations. So everything about Alger Hiss seemed to speak of, uh, of Western values. But I think we have to look at it in terms of uh, the Great Depression. The Great Depression just blew the bottom out of a lot of people's confidence in the capitalist system. Uh, and many, uh, many uh, upright um, blue blood uh, Americans uh, were drawn to uh, Stalin's siren song, to Marxist Leninism and were willing to betray their country. I think it's important to realize that all of these agents of influence, these 500 Soviet spies were not paid for their betrayal. They were willing agents who came into the communist party and found their way um, as Soviet agents. And just to give you a brief understanding of how devastating this was, it's not just Alger Hiss, at Yalta being debriefed every morning, giving away half of Eastern Europe, being instrumental in the return of 2 million Soviet refugees to their certain death, uh, being transported back to the Soviet Union. That was all part of the Yalta agreement. 2 million Soviet refugees to their almost certain death were part and parcel of what Alger Hiss concocted. His colleague in the uh, Treasury Department, Harry Dexter White. Very briefly, Harry Dexter White was called on by his Soviet handler, Viktor Pavlov, in the summer of 1939, before the US was in the Second World War. And he was told to meet in the uh, Old Abbott's Grill, a restaurant across the street from Treasury. I know it well. And he's, Viktor Pavlov said, I will meet you uh, in the restaurant for lunch, I'll be carrying a copy of the New Yorker, that's how you'll know me. They sat down to lunch together and Viktor Pavlov passed a piece of paper across the street to, uh, to Harry Dexter White and said, I want you to read this and put it to memory. Harry Dexter White, White read what was on that piece of paper, wanted to put it in his pocket. Viktor Pavlov says, no, pass it back to me. Just put it to your mind, put it in your memory. Harry White did. Harry Dexter White did. On that piece of paper was a plan by Soviet intelligence known as Operation White. Operation Snow White was the actual name. In it was a plan for 
Harry Dexter White and his colleagues in Treasury and Soviet and the State Department to increase the pressure of American sanctions on the Japanese. That is ratcheting up the sanctions on oil, rubber, metals, material, any kind of war related stuff uh, to ratchet up those sanctions on Japan because we were, Japan was fighting a war and China also fighting a war against the Soviet Union at the very same time in Manchuria and Siberia. So the plan was the Soviets wanted us to increase the pressure on the Japanese and by ratcheting up that pressure, um, convince the uh, Japanese military that instead of going north into Manchuria, Siberia, fighting more in China, that they would go south. And in fact, that's just what they did. They attacked Pearl Harbor and went south to the oil fields in Indonesia and the Philippines. Um, and that was what started the Second World War. The Soviet Union, Operation Snow, Harry Dexter's White was to make sure that the Soviet Union didn't have a two front war, one in Siberia, uh, one in Europe. So Harry Dexter White, instrumental in pushing and prompting the Japanese to, uh, to uh, do the sneak attack on, uh, on Pearl Harbor. That is pretty extraordinary. And just quickly, William Wiseman, who is an army intelligence, another Soviet spy, uh, in the years after the second war was over, uh, William Wiseband found out that American military intelligence had broken the Soviet military codes, understood the disposition of Soviet military equipment. Uh, they were reading the, the cable traffic. They knew where Stalin was putting men and supplies. Uh, and so we knew pretty much where Stalin was moving in terms of military pressure. William Weisman, uh, in a dead drop, gave away the truth that American military intelligence had broken the Soviet codes to the KGB, to his KGB handler. Uh, and immediately upon getting that information, the Soviet Union, the military codes went dark. They changed their codes. We were in the dark. What happened? Stalin then moved men and materiel to North Korea for the invasion of South Korea. Incredible amounts of material were moved out uh, to the North Koreans to prepare uh, for the Korean War. If we had known about that, if we had not been in the dark, if it had not been from William Weissman, we would have known about that. Truman would have warned Stalin that we would have, that we would uh, fight if there was an invasion of the South. And by all estimates, Stalin at that point would have thought better about moving this men and material and starting the Korean War, a Korean War where 50,000 Americans died. So William Wiseman, a spy, very much uh, instrumental in the Korean War. Harry Dexter White, very much instrumental in, uh, in the attack on Pearl Harbor. So spies matter, spies of influence matter even more, and history matters, we need to know about them. Well, as I said earlier in the show, the, the outro, his case, and all the related stories and personalities are endlessly fascinating. And Gods of Deception is a fascinating book. I'm enjoying reading it, and I would encourage other people to, to read it as well. David Adams Cleveland, thank you for joining me today on Profiles. This has been a Wonderful conversation. Thank you for doing it. Charlie, thank you so much. And thank you for your fans on Nantucket. And thank you to the 50 readers who bought copies uh, at Mitchell's uh, bookstore last Sunday. And I hope your readers will go back to Mitchell's and find more copies of God's Deception there. Indeed. For Profiles on Nantucket Community Television, I'm Charlie Walters. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you'll tune in again. 